It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, were prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on this here program, I am absolutely delighted to have you if you want to. Now, I got to I got to shift things up real quick here because it's important to me that we go through this. I've played this audio before. And I need to have an extended moment of your time. There is some breaking news you should know about first. Uh, The FBI has disrupted a plot from the Iranian National Guard to a Revolutionary Guard, rather the Iranian Revolutionary Guard to assassinate John Bolton, who was Donald Trump's uh, national security advisor for a time. Uh, The Iranian Revolutionary Guard was attempting to find uh, or bring into the country Islamic radicals to assassinate John Bolton. Uh, At least one person has been detained by federal authorities over this. And yet Joe Biden wants to cut a deal with these people. We will circle back to that. But I want to talk about this last hour, and, and I, I took phone calls and said, and I'm happy to take your calls, 877-973-7425. But if you subscribe to my daily email, and you should, you can by texting DATA to 33777, you would see this video. It would be yours for posterity. I want to play for you this video montage. It only goes through the first year and a half of the Trump administration. I have played it before. It's really worth it. It, 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 This is an unlocked piece. Anybody can see it. Uh, So if you text data to 33777 and you click through uh, the link that I send, you can see this for yourself. You don't have to have me play it. And I wish you would read what I wrote. I want to talk about what I wrote. But I wish you'd read it for yourself. Because the first take, the written take, is usually the best. I'm not going to read it word for word because that would sound very stilted. But I I do want to talk about it. And to begin with, so that you understand where I'm going with this, I've got to play for you this video. This is a video montage. Again, it's the first year and a half's news coverage of the Trump administration. Important that you understand the context into which I'm headed. Breaking news. A bombshell. Today is a turning point. Today was historically bad for President Trump. Today was a turning point. A turning point. We're at a turning point here. The beginning of the end for the Trump presidency. We have another bombshell. Mike Pence might have to assume the office of the presidency. Rumblings of the word impeachment. Breaking news. Another bombshell out of the White House. I believe this is the beginning of the end. I do too. It's really the beginning of the end. He may be feeling the walls closing in on him. All the walls closing in on him. The walls closing in in on him. Breaking news, a new bombshell. One astrologer says this means the beginning of the end for President Donald Trump. Trump will resign. Trump is going to resign. Is this the tipping point? I know we've said it over and over. You think this is a tipping point? And over and over. This is a tipping point. And over and over. Breaking news, President Trump off the rails. It was the beginning of the end today. The beginning of the end. Breaking news tonight, new bombshell. This is the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. The walls are closing in. The walls closing in. The walls closing in. Breaking overnight bombshell. This is a very dramatic day and I think it might be near a tipping point. Do you think this is a tipping point? December 1st, 2017, you can point. December 1st, 2017, you can mark it down. This is the day that everything changed. The beginning of the end. 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 We begin tonight with a bombshell. Donald Trump is in a lot of trouble. Trump is in trouble. The president will resign. Another hour, another bombshell. This is a tipping point. Trump's going down. This president could be impeached. Resignation. Resignation. I don't think this president is going to serve out his term. Mr. Trump will not serve out his term. He will not serve out his term. No way. 
know-how. Breaking news. Absolute bombs. Donald Trump is not. He's done. And it's over. It's over. The wall's closing in. The wall's closing in. This is going to be the Achilles heel. Breaking news tonight. I expect Trump to depart. This week will be the watershed week. Trump is in big trouble. Trump's in a lot of trouble. It's a sign of a terrified old man who feels the walls closing in. The walls are increasingly closing in on him. Tonight, the walls are closing in. Today changed everything. This is the beginning of the end. Today, the biggest tipping point for the Trump administration. What a historic day. The bombshells. He's underwater. He feels the walls closing in. Turning point. We may be at a tipping point. It's the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. Another bombshell. 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 This is a bombshell. It is a <laughs> That was just the first year and a half of Donald Trump's administration. If you can't understand why so many people are reacting with a blasé attitude towards the FBI uh, storming into Mar-a-Lago to seize some boxes of papers, I hope that video helps you understand why. For the sake of argument, now I have to be careful here because I know how some people react. All I'm saying is for the sake of argument, I'm not saying it is so, just for the sake of argument. Let's just say for the sake of argument, the FBI and the Department of Justice have clear and convincing evidence that Donald Trump and others orchestrated the riot into the United States Capitol and the intent was to stop the counting of the Electoral College to thwart the lawful and peaceful transfer of power from one administration to the next. Just for the sake of argument. And I would throw in clearly Congressman Scott Perry. Congressman Scott Perry, he's the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, the conservatives in the House. He had his cell phone taken by the FBI yesterday. So let's say they got evidence, Scott Perry, Donald Trump and the like, that they clearly plotted to stop the certification of the Electoral College, which would be illegal. Stopping Congress from acting to transfer power is illegal. The FBI raided John Clark's house. John Clark was uh, Donald Trump's trusted man at the Department of Justice. Purportedly, it was for an inspector general's uh, report on whether or not he was uh, conducting himself uh, at the Department of Justice according to standards. They then raided John Eastman. They took John Eastman's cell phone. They've now taken Scott Perry's cell phone. They clearly think they're onto something. They're looking for some conclusive smoking gun. They can say they went to Mar-a-Lago for these documents from the National Archives, but that increasingly looks like a pretext. They were really looking for something related to January 6th. Let's say for the sake of the argument, they got clear and convincing evidence, just for the sake of argument. I hope you understand why so many people will until the very end, and even then if, say, worst case scenario, Donald Trump is found guilty of something, be incredulous with anything the prosecutors say or law enforcement does or the media says. I hope you'll understand why people will not take it seriously, why people will be dismissive of it. It doesn't have as much to do with the cult around Donald Trump as it does with the cult against Donald Trump. I've played this video montage for you the first year and a half of the Trump administration. It was all beginning to the end, the walls closing in, the tipping point, the breaking point. He's not going to serve out his term. That was the media commentary on all of the networks, including Fox, for the first year and a half. Half the country disagrees with that. Half of the country thinks Donald Trump was a good president. Half of the country may not like him personally, but think he got results. The problem for that half of the country is that part of the half of the country that hates him is the part of the country that makes up the reporter class, the anchor core of major news outlets, the talking heads and the chattering class, the editorialists, the supposed nonpartisan think tankers like the Brookings people, and the policy walks embedded within the federal government. And they have been relentless on a nonstop drumbeat for impeachment and indictment since the day before he won in 2016. I mean, since he got the Republican nomination in 2016, they've been out to get him. 
I've lost track of the number of stories and narratives that were so easily advanced by the press only to be retracted or substantially advised. Remember, there was the CNN story about what James Comey would say to Congress in sworn testimony. They got it wrong. There was also three weeks later, the CNN story about Anthony Scaramucci was supposedly working with a Russian hedge fund. That was wrong. They got the story about the clearing of Lafayette Park wrong. An inspector general report came out and said, nope, everything the media said was wrong. To this day, McClatchy News Service maintains and refuses to retract a story that Michael Cohen, the president's former lawyer, flew to Prague to meet with Russian agents. It's not true. The Mueller report thoroughly debunks it, and McClatchy has refused to walk it back. Or there was the BuzzFeed story that Donald Trump made Michael Cohen lie to Congress in testimony. And Robert Mueller, in his investigation, actually came out the only time he ever did this and said the story's nonsense, refuted the story. It's the only time he ever came out so publicly prior to the release of his report and refuted something. And the media ran with it anyway. These people bought into the idea the Russians stole the 2016 election and Donald Trump was a Russian plant. They've never liked him. They've never believed him. They've never treated him as legitimate. And now they have the audacity to think that we should treat them legitimately. I mean, for God's sakes, the New York Times ran a story from Miles Taylor, then under the name Anonymous, claiming there were embedded subversives within the Trump administration working to subvert and sabotage his agenda on behalf of the country. Clearly, there is an elite in this country that believe it is their way or the highway. They are the only ones who know how to govern and guide the country, and anyone who thinks differently is wrong. Maybe the Department of Justice and the FBI have the goods on Trump. Maybe they do. For the sake of argument, let's say they do. Maybe Donald Trump really did try to organize and participate in, collaborate and see through a coup to stop the lawful, peaceful transfer of power. But also, maybe he didn't. The problem is, I am willing to concede for the sake of argument, maybe maybe they got the goods on him. But none of you who hate Donald Trump can bring yourself to concede that maybe he didn't do anything illegal. You're so convinced of his awfulness, you can't even understand why anyone would support him. And you belittle those people, you ridicule those people, you shame those people, you cast pejoratives on those people. Look, there are some people who to this day, despite all the evidence to the contrary, believe the election was stolen. And I am perfectly happy belittling those idiots. But there are 76 million, 78 million people who supported Donald Trump, overwhelmingly very good people, and they supported him because of policy outcomes they preferred that, if we're honest about it, were pretty inside the mainstream of Republican politics. And yet the media treats them all as pariahs. The media hates them all. Look at Scott Meyer, Peter Meyer. Peter Meyer. Congressman from Michigan's 3rd Congressional District lost. He voted for impeachment against against Donald Trump. Republican voted to impeach Donald Trump. After his election was over, he shook hands with John Gibbs, the man who beat him, the Trump-endorsed candidate who beat him. The media now thinks that Peter Meyer is in on the coup. The media is blasting Peter Meyer for daring to normalize these people. That gives you a sense of the brokenness of the American media on this stuff. These are the people who argued moving the American embassy to Jerusalem would start a war, and it didn't. They argued that withdrawing from the Iran deal would start a war, and it didn't. They argued that the Paris Accord would get us punished globally. It didn't. They argued that killing Kasim Soleimani would start a regional war. It didn't. They cheered on left-wing federal judges blocking Trump administration initiatives and are now upset conservative judges are doing the same. They encouraged saboteurs and obstructionists to invade the Trump administration to block them. They tried desperately to stop energy independence from America during Trump's administration and now cover for Joe Biden as he sabotages our energy independence. They defended Hunter Biden and encouraged Twitter to censor the New York Post. They refused to accept that Joe Biden's spending plan not only caused inflation, but wage declines. They've quickly embraced the phrase pregnant people and can no longer tell you what a woman is. And they were perfectly fine when Democrats wanted banks and cash apps to report to the IRS your transactions. And now they're perfectly fine with 87,000 IRS agents coming after you. And they will deny to the end of days that this is to target the middle class. These people are 
water carriers for the left, and they claim some independence. And they don't understand why anyone could support Donald Trump. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's because Donald Trump is not them. That's why so many can support him. I mean, we saw FBI agents falsely make accusations in order to get a warrant on Carter Page. We read the text messages from Peter Strzok. We saw the FBI and DOJ lose the case on the Gretchen Whitmer kidnappers. We saw them screw up the Jeffrey Epstein case and the Larry Nassar case. We saw many of these same elite cheering on the FBI condemn small business owners for protesting, only to demand we all protest against George Floyd. We're a nation that's really divided, and the press has taken a side, and so nobody believes the press. They've discredited themselves. We're beyond the beginning of the end for people taking the press seriously. We have, it is clear, an elite in this country who occupy powers and positions of influence and seats in the media who have insisted the country must work the way they want. And if anyone comes along, including Donald Trump, who says, no, no, we think we would like to operate it differently, they will do everything possible they can to stop him and hound him from office and persecute him. So is it any wonder that people are skeptical now. Maybe Donald Trump actually broke the law. Or maybe they're just going to keep going after him until they can find something to get him because they hate him for daring to show that the country could be governed in a way different from what the elite and the so-called expert opinion said it could. And they resent like hell that they've now been exposed as frauds and they got to punish someone. Might as well start there since he might run again. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Y'all got to be patient on the phones because I went really long in that last segment. I had some points to make, but I've got to play this audio. I was negligent. Well, I don't even have time to play this audio. I I will play it when I come back. Um, I just think that we have to remember the media doesn't understand us. They, They don't know how to poll us anymore. That's why the polling has a Democratic bent to it, even as the Electoral College has a Republican bias, because they they don't know how to poll us anymore. They they don't know how to talk to us. They don't know how to reach us. They've largely given up on us because they don't like us. They've written us off. And I really do think, I, I am of the opinion, I genuinely believe there are a group of technocrats in this country who believe that they and they alone can pull the levers and press the buttons and flip the switches in a way to get the economy and the nation going the way they want, diplomatically, politically, uh, in terms of international affairs and the like, and they resent like hell anyone coming in and thinking they can do better. We are not really a government of for and by the people anymore. We are a government of for and by the technocrats, and they uh, exist within the media as well. And they set so many of the prevailing narratives of the country and of the way the media covers stuff. And the whole reason they really hate Trump supporters and Donald Trump is because essentially for four years, Trump supporters and Trump tried to wrest away control from the levers and switches. Someone needs to do that still, which is also why they hate Ron DeSantis. Now, I want you, speaking of levers and switches, to get online and go to omahasteaks.com and put Eric, E-R-I-C-K, in the search bar, and you can press the button and get delicious steak delivered to your door. Omaha, listen, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm obligated to tell you, you get 12 burgers for free, and they actually are really good burgers. Had some the other night. Um, you get steak, you get pork chops, you get chicken breast, but I, I got to tell you this. Omaha Steaks has been doing this since 1917. The founder jumped ship in America, fleeing religious persecution in Eastern Europe, got on a train and went to where it looked like home to him, and that happened to be Omaha, Nebraska. He got off there, became an entrepreneur, began selling steaks on railroads, providing meals on the trains. His descendants started a mail order business. They've been doing this since 1917. They want you as a long-term customer. They give you 100% satisfaction guarantee. So go to omahasteaks.com, put Eric, E-R-I-C-K in the search bar, get the All-American Assortment, begin your relationship with Omaha Steaks today. They have so much more from fresh Fresh seafood to delicious sides and desserts. OmahaSteaks.com. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson nationwide from Atlanta, Georgia. Well outside the Beltway. Uh, perspective <laughs> over the fruited plain, if you will. I would like to take your phone calls and we have people on hold. So 
I'm going to go to the phones before I say anything else. Let's let you have your say and ask your questions. John, you're going to be up next. John, welcome to the program. How are you? Hey, Eric, I'm doing well. How are you doing? And uh, I hope, uh, hope, your, hope your wife is home doing well after uh, uh, yesterday's ordeal. She is. Thank you for asking. She is. Everything's well. We'll do it again on Election Day, no less. Uh, well, uh, I've... I hate it for her, but but uh, you gotta you gotta love that uh, she's uh, five years into a two year plan. You know what I mean? Amen. Thank you. There we go. Um, I was wondering, with all this tribalism in this blue and red pure that we're seeing in the media and in uh, the social world, I'm wondering what event do you foresee that might be the Harper's Ferry of uh, of our current uh, political strife? Oh gosh! Um, oh, I mean, I, I see plenty of uh, uh, red-sided uh, John Browns ready to, um, you know, free the oppressed, and uh, right, um, you know, the, and of course with John Brown, the way he did it, uh, you know, was uh, kind of thinking outside the box. But uh, with the oppression that we're seeing from our brown-shirted um, National Socialist Workers Party. Uh, opposition who deem us not to be simply misguided as we deem them they actually deem us as evil i mean john brown was considered evil in his day um yeah. so i'm wondering you know what what sort of a uh, harper's ferry john brown event do you see coming forward you know if i, uh, if I might use the historical context. yeah so i actually think here's if i had to guess i know that the the conventional wisdom from the left is that it's going to be some person on the right acts out in violence um yeah, i that's, am that's actually the john brown thing yes i'm more concerned about someone from the left acting out in violence uh do they try to go after donald trump or his family or ron DeSantis? Well, they um, already have let ask scalise about that yes yeah that's true that that's absolutely Hello. true uh, Wasn't but Bernie's you, you know, fault. Ha, ha, ha. yes, and and they 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 wanted to downplay that, but I think we're getting to the point where they're not going to be able to. I I have a theory, uh, John. What it's going to be though, and I think the leftover, I I think the leftover plays their hand, and I think it's going to be an environmentalist. That's that's what I think it's going to be. Um, I think that the Republicans will take back the House and the Senate in November. You will have a Republican get elected in 2024. They will begin to roll back parts of the Biden agenda, particularly the climate change stuff. And I think you will see some aggressive terrorist acts by environmentalists. And I think that will become the tipping point in this country uh, where you will have members of the media justify the acts as necessary to save the planet. And it will not go the way that they think it should go. Um, They think people will rally to that side, and I don't believe that they will. Um, That's that's my prevailing theory. Now, there will be isolated incidents in the lead up to that on the left and the right, but I think that's going to be the big one that happens. You know who Carl Sagan was? Carl Sagan was the science fiction and and science writer. Uh, He was also a prognosticator of the future. He and Arthur C. Clarke probably in the the 60s, 70s, and 80s, really uh, foresaw the way the world was headed. I thought this might be fake, but it's not. It's actually real. This is a quote from Carl Sagan in 1995, relevant to John's point. Again, this is written in 1995. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. I have a foreboding of an America in my children or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. When the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority. When clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide, almost without noticing, back into superstition and darkness. 
The dumbing down of America is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media. The 30-second sound bites now down to 10 seconds or less. Lowest common denominator programming. Credulous presentations on pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. Boston Hospital is now performing hysterectomies on minors. Yep, that's true. You can get gender-affirming hysterectomies without having to wait to get through puberty at Boston Children's Hospital in the name of affirming gender care. Pseudoscience and superstition from people who consult crystals and horoscopes. I think Carl Sagan might have been onto something. What he foresaw was postmodernism, which was right on the horizon as he was writing this in 1995. And there you have it. I think he was right. Let's go back to the phones. Joe, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show. Joe, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. I uh, love your deep thoughts. Love it. Thank you. Uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, you talked about the total number of uh, registered voters in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the number I got off the Internet, and of course, you know, everything's true on the Internet, but what I got was 168 million. Mm -hmm. And then the last presidential election, the numbers I got were 155 million, which will be 92 percent of the registered voters. That just seems way out of whack to me. Yeah, so it varies. Um, there, let's see, from 2021, um, 239,247,182 people were eligible to vote in 2020. Um, 206,557,583 million five hundred fifty seven thousand five hundred eighty three actually registered to vote in this country. Okay, so um, my that's numbers, my number is is lower. So yeah, so uh, give me your number again. One hundred sixty eight million total registered. Yep. Okay. Uh, one hundred sixty eight million total registered. I I'm looking at this from the U.S. Census Bureau Voter Registration Supplement to Current Population Survey. Just so you know where I'm getting it. Uh, in 2018, there were 156 million registered voters. In 2019, prior to the 2020 registration push, there were 159 million registered voters. Uh, by the end of 2020, there were 206 million 557 thousand. 583 registered voters in the United States. Now, keep in mind that a whole lot of those people don't actually go vote, but when you get your driver's license, they register you to vote, so that's why the number is so big. Right. So yep. if 155 million votes were cast in the presidential election, uh -huh. that would be what percentage? That'd be almost, what, 75%? 62 62.5% roughly. Still seems historically high, but yeah, oh, your was. numbers are better than mine. You look, no, no, it, it was it was absolutely a historically high turnout in 2020. Um, we had not seen a turnout that high in a very long time. Both sides have been able to get their bases out and turn out new people. Um, part of the whole issue here is that uh, a lot of Republicans incredulously say, do you really believe 81 million people voted for Joe Biden? He never even got people at events. Well, he never got out of his basement to have events. But, I mean, it, it's but turnout was between 60 and 65 percent, which is very high, but increasingly common. Uh, in 2016, it was also over 60 percent turnout for the presidential election. But the Democrats got very, very aggressive after that, uh, a, rounding up and registering voters. The Republicans did, too. Both sides aggressively registered people after the 2016 election to try to hold on. Uh, Dave, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show. Dave, you there? Dave? All right. Dave didn't hear him, but he wanted to talk about a convention of the states, and I have the answer for him. 
Uh, I think a convention of the states is increasingly likely. If Carrie Lake is elected in Arizona, she says she's going to try to get the Arizona legislature to approve a convention of the states. Um, The number of states that will have approved a convention of the states goes up. I've always been hesitant to have a convention of the states because of the ability potentially to have it hijacked uh, by malicious souls. That being said, at this point, I I think we're probably headed down the path of needing to have one. And the reason we need to have one is there are things that need to be settled. Uh, There are restraints in Washington that need to be put in place. And frankly, you still have to have three quarters of the states approve those things, those amendments that would come out of a convention of the states. Essentially, two thirds of the states can force Congress to call a convention of states to amend the Constitution. The hangup is can those states prescribe the things that must be done or must they have an open convention? The danger here, if you will recall, is that historically the uh, founders had the Articles of Confederation and they got together a convention to amend the Articles of Confederation. And what came out of it was a brand new document called the Constitution. So there's always been some level of hang up of can, is this legit or sh- can we limit it? And there is some thought that if Congress limits the call to address certain things, uh, combine it with the amendments have expiration dates by which they must be passed, you're in pretty good stead. And and I think at this point, I've, I've been hesitant for the ability to hijack it. But at this point, I honestly think this is the way we're going to have to go and settle some of the stuff. Maybe it goes our way, maybe it doesn't. Three quarters of the states would have to approve, but we're kind of headed in the direction of uh, we need to settle and restrain Washington, and we need to provide clarity uh, to what Washington can and cannot do. And right now, I think is probably the best time to do this. You know, one of the groups out there that's a big advocate of uh, convention of the states and helping conservatives get this done and fix the constitutional structure is Patriot Mobile. They give a portion of their profits to conservative causes around the country. And if you become a customer of theirs, you grow their profits. And by growing their profits, you then grow their ability to uh, shape and support the conservative movement. What you do is you go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric, patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. You sign up with them. You can roll your existing service over to them. You can get new service. If you have, for example, an existing phone number, they can take it over, or you can just get a new one from them if you want a new number. You can also call them. They got 100% U.S.-based customer service, 972-PATRIOT. 972 Patriot. Make sure you tell them I sent you and you'll get free activation and good discounts. If you're an NRA member, if you're a teacher, if you're a veteran, a first responder, if you got a number of lines because you got a lot of kids who need cell phones, well, you probably want to do business with Patriot Mobile. It is patriotmobile.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, or 972 Patriot. Howdy. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson. It is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to call in and enjoy my voice on the phone, let's go to someone who clearly wants to do that. Timothy, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hello, Eric. A good show like usual. I know you're really good at dissecting these polls, but I'm seeing a generic ballot now where the the, uh, Democrats are leading Republicans in a mammoth poll. And so can you know anything about this poll? Yeah, uh, so the Monmouth poll, there are a couple you should know. So Economist has one that has Democrats up six. Politico has one that has Democrats up one. Uh, The Monmouth University poll has the Democrats up three. Um, Let me give you the details of the Monmouth poll. First, it's a little old. Uh, It came out at the end of July. And so the Politico poll of Democrats up one is 2005 registered voters, not likely voters, just general registered voters. Well, there's always a bias towards Democrats in a registered voter poll. The Monmouth University poll only has 751 registered voters. So they have an entire nationwide survey, but only 751 people. Everyone's kind of dismissed it. Now for perspective, let's take that Monmouth University poll and compare it to the CBS News poll that has 1,537 likely voters. Now, the difference between a likely voter and a registered voter. A registered voter is simply, are you registered to vote? 
a likely voter is. Uh, are you registered to vote? Yes. Do you know when the election is? Yes. Have you voted in past elections? Yes. Do you plan to vote in the current election? Yes. Well, then you're a likely voter. So the CBS News battleground poll that excludes California and New York because there are no battleground states, no battlegrounds there. They look at the 50 battleground congressional districts around the country. It, of 1,534, I'm sorry, 1,537 likely voters, people who are likely to vote, it has Republicans up too. So you can decide which poll you trust better. Uh, I'm going to put my money on the likely voter poll. We are less than 100 days away from the election. We will start seeing more and more likely voter polls. And I'm looking um, in every likely voter poll that I see right now, the Republicans are ahead. It is the, So in the USA Today Suffolk, it's 1,000 registered voters, dims up four. In the Monmouth poll, 751 registered voters, dims up three. Politico Morning Consult, 2,005 registered voters, dims up one. Economist YouGov, 1,331 registered voters, dims up six. Now, Rasmussen has 2,500 likely voters, Republicans up three. Insider Advantage, 800 likely voters, Republicans up one. CBS News, 1,537 likely voters, Republicans up two. Uh, Trafalgar Group, Republican-leaning group, uh, 1,085 likely voters, Republicans up eight. Emerson College, 1,074. They actually are registered voters there. They're Republicans up one. Uh, and then Harvard Harris uses 1,885 registered voters, not likely voters, and it's a tied race. It, I would, however, Timothy, ignore the individual polls and look at the polling average. The polling average has Republicans up one tenth of one percent. Keep in mind that Republicans tend to do about two points better in the average of the generic ballot. So if Republicans are up 0.1 in the average, they're probably up 2.1, which is not a massive Republican way, but it's still the Republicans take the House and probably the Senate. The other big issue, because polling tends to be tied to the president's polling in midterms, remember midterms tend to be a referendum on the current president. Well, Joe Biden is still below 40%. Not much. But he's still below 39.9% approval right now. He is down. uh, The spread is negative 16.1. There's a 56% disapproval and a 39.9% approval. Uh, That's bad. Um, Keep in mind as well that Rasmussen reports, which is considered a Republican leaning firm, They have the Republicans up about two points on the generic ballot, uh, and they've actually got higher public approval for Joe Biden than anybody else out there right now. I mean, the only reason Joe Biden is close to 40 in the generic ballot is because Rasmussen has him at 45 percent. Reuters has him at 40, Economist at 41, Politico 39, IBD Tip 39, Insider Advantage 38, Monmouth 38, Harris 38. USA Today, 39. He's not doing well anywhere. That's part of the problem the Democrats are having to deal with right now. Eventually, gravity pulls you down. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.